Well, we had a rather full schedule uh, last Sunday of all kinds of different things, and unfortunately, my mind uh, neglected to recognize our veterans, as last week was Veterans Day, and I apologize for that, but I still think it's appropriate, as this is Thanksgiving week. I know I'm thankful for the freedom that we get to enjoy in this country, as I was even thinking this last week and reading about some of the people that are currently being imprisoned all over the world for doing nothing else other than saying that they want to follow Jesus with their lives, I was especially grateful for those that have served in our military. And if you have served in the military and you are a veteran, we'd just like to thank you for your service. If you wouldn't mind standing so we can recognize you and just say thank you for your service. Thank you so much. You know, I just, uh, the freedom that Christ gives that I, many times I know in my life I've taken it for granted, whether spiritually or even just here civilly. The fact that we get to go to, you can go to the grocery store, you can drive around. I don't, I, I'm not fearing for my life as many I know that are happening in, in the war that's been going on in Ukraine now for nine months. And it's just one of those things that make sure to be thankful to the Lord for all of the different things that he gives us every single day. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Especially sometimes when life can get you down and make you just feel like you're being beaten down again and again and again and you don't feel like getting back up. That's one of those times you, you are in good company, that phrase... His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness comes from the book of Lamentations. It was a lament over endless sin and the people of God just turning away from God again and again and again. And yet, God is always faithful to us. Even though the world seems like it may be crashing down around us, let us never neglect to be grateful, especially for the cross, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord. And he is alive today. And we get to serve a living Savior. So as we come to the scriptures today, we like to pray this from Psalms 86 each week. Focus in our hearts on the teaching of God's word. So let's read, pray this together. Ready and begin. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. And at this time, the children can be dismissed to go to the junior church. And as they're being dismissed, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, once again, we're going to finish off chapter 10 today. As we continue going verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke, just to once again kind of set up the scene here a little bit, at the beginning, uh, kind of the middle of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10, it's amazing to me to think about the fact that the first nine chapters of Luke comprise 30 or so, 33 or so years of Jesus' life, and chapters 10 through 24 are the last six months of Jesus' life. So clearly there is a lot of great teaching in here that is, God wants us to focus in on as Jesus is preparing his disciples and preparing himself to go to the cross. And as we are just now five or so months away from when we get to celebrate the resurrection on Easter, Resurrection Sunday, really that's why we come together every single Sunday is to remember and celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive, but especially during that time, really we're kind of right in the, the same timetable. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to get through the next 14 chapters in the next five months, so you're just going to have to hang on, I guess. But uh, here at the end of chapter 10, last week, Jesus has sent out his 70 disciples. They've come back. They were rejoicing. And then Jesus gave the story, one of the most well-known stories of all time, of the Good Samaritan. And following that, we pick it up now in verse 38. 
Now it happened as they went, that's Jesus and all of his disciples. Remember, it's not just the 12. There's quite a big group now that's been following him around. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So Jesus has arrived in this village. It's the village of Bethany. We know that from elsewhere in the Gospels. That's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. Very, very, very close friends of Jesus. This is the same Lazarus that in John chapter 11 had died. Jesus gets the report. A couple of days later, they start to go to Bethany, and then upon arrival, Jesus, if only you were here, then our brother wouldn't have had to die. This is where we also get the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. But then he goes, commands them to roll, move the stone, and says, Lazarus, come forth. He had to call out Lazarus, many theologians have said, because if he just simply said, come forth, every single dead body in the vicinity would have come forth. So he had to be very specific with who he was resurrecting, because that is the power of our Lord. That's this family now. So you think Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they've got this opportunity that Jesus... The great teacher, the Messiah, he's coming to our house. I don't know about you, but when uh, I have guests coming over, it's not just kind of the everyday normal cleaning that takes place. It's the, all right, kids, let's clean all this stuff up. That little garbage pile that sits over there in the corner that nobody ever pays attention to, it's just kind of just become a part of the, the, the countertop there. Get rid of that thing. Let's purge all this stuff out. Let's clean this. My wife was actually been doing this this last, uh, just yesterday. Uh, went in the kids and we were, she was kind of winterizing the backyard a little bit. Now that the storms are actually starting to come and there's just things that have been all over the place and these things have blown that way. And uh, my, uh, my little pile of Mountain Dew cans that I pitch out the back door and are supposed to go into a trash can, but it's overflowing and the wind kind of blew some of them around. We got to clean all that stuff up too. You know, because we got guests coming over this week. It's Thanksgiving. We got family coming. We got friends coming. There's going to be a lot of people. So you clean up. And this is not just any guest. This is Jesus coming. I can only imagine what Martha was going through. Everything's got to be perfect. I mean, when he comes in, we got the order. The food's got to be on the table. We got to make sure this happens and this happens and this happens. And we got the schedule down. You can tell that Martha, I would guess, is probably a very type A kind of person. Now, I want everything to be very, very organized. On the flip side of that now, so Jesus shows up. She's and the, the, the old King James says she is cumbered about with much serving. Or here, she was distracted with much serving. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. Now, I know a lot of times what ends up happening is people try to put this on some kind of a spectrum and say, look, here it is. You either have to do this, you either are serving, or you're listening. I'm going to posit to you today that service and discipleship do not have to be mutually exclusive. It's not a choice of one or the other. I'm either going to serve or I'm going to learn. Everything in due season. Well, back in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time for everything. There is a season for everything. There's a season to laugh. There's a season to mourn. There's a season to be filled with joy, and there is a season to weep. 
Here, I think we can also learn from this that there is a season to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his word, and there is also a season to go out and serve. But, in this case, here's the problem. Instead of making an either-or choice, I want to put it on a spectrum. Over here, you only serve, and over here, you only sit. Mary, in this moment, is recognizing this is a very special time. Not only do we get to hear Jesus teach, but he is in our home. And it was very common at the day that when you would talk about having a rabbi or having a teacher, that you would sit at their feet. Even the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, it says that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. That was who he was taught by and learned from as he was becoming a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Benjamite, circumcised on the eighth day. I was a Pharisee. I knew the law inside and outside. To be a Pharisee, you had to have the first five books of the Bible memorized. Not just understood, not just, yeah, I've got the gist of it. Nope, completely rote memory. So if you were considered a Pharisee, you had some brain power to memorize stuff. So now Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, hearing his word, learning from him, being discipled, but because Martha, unfortunately, she had gotten this too far to this side of the serving, she was distracted with the serving. Hey, my Christian brothers and sisters, we got to be careful that in our service in the church and service to the Lord, that that doesn't become the end. Serving Christ is a means to an end. It's a means to drawing my brothers and sisters closer to Christ. It's a means to drawing the world to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the end is Jesus. The end is not the service. If I think that I'm a great Christian now because I've served a man, I tell you what, look at here's my here's my resume of all the stuff that I've done. Bam, 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 bam. Why don't you do that much? Wrong attitude. And Martha, cumbered about with much serving, distracted from what Jesus was saying. This is God in the flesh, in her house giving the very words of God. And she was distracted because the the charcuterie board didn't look perfect. She was distracted because some some of the goblets on the table were, they needed to be refilled. And she was probably hustling and bustling. She's sweating a little bit, and here's Mary just sitting. She kind of grabs Jesus and pulls him aside. Hey, Lord, can you tell Mary to help me out here? Oh, Martha. Martha, Martha. Another one of those times, I really wish I could hear the inflection in which Jesus said this. I personally imagine he said it in a very tender way, knowing that she meant well, knowing that she thought She was doing exactly the right thing. And even trying to kind of remind Jesus a little bit, hey, this is what we're supposed to do. You ever done that with God? Kind of reminded God, hey, God, don't you remember that this is the way it's supposed to be? God's like, yeah, I know. But Martha... You are worried and troubled about many things. Here's the problem. When our service becomes so distracting and convoluted that we're missing Jesus in all of it, we're missing the depth and the power of the Word of God and the Gospel in it, and we're just doing stuff in church just to do stuff, when the the original mission behind that event or that fellowship time, or whatever it is. When that mission has gone away, and now it's just something, well, it's on the calendar, and if we don't do it on the calendar every single year, then, I mean, we're just not a good church anymore. 
When the event becomes the end, rather than Jesus being the end, the event needs to go away. There are no sacred cows in the church. Anything that becomes an idol to us that we become distracted by and we are worried about many things, but we miss Jesus? That's an idol. Oh, but no, it's, I didn't craft some little piece of stone or wood and stick it on a, on a tree somewhere. I don't go outside. I don't pray to that thing. Yeah, but how upset are you if that thing doesn't happen? tell you it's been very convicting to me over the years when there are things I'm like no this is just the way it's supposed to be this is the way church has to be these are these are things that you are not a good church if you don't have and it became a thing the thing was the thing rather than jesus being the thing and man when that when that hits when that recognition comes in when you hear jesus say you are worried and troubled about many things And after all, isn't it Jesus that said in Matthew chapter 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. All the worries of life, all the daily bread that we need, all the clothes that we need, all the provision, all of those things come after seeking the kingdom of Christ. And also, he says, you're worried, you're anxious. I believe it's in Philippians that it says that we're supposed to be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But you've got to go to Him. I tell you even this, Prayer itself can become an idol if I'm putting my faith in prayer rather than in the God who listens to and answers my prayer. You're worried. You're troubled about many things. When I just need to focus on one thing, knowing Christ. If you focus on knowing Him and hearing His Word and hearing His Spirit speak to you, I guarantee you all those other things, they're going to fall into place. Because you will have the wisdom that you will need. You'll have the strength that you need. You'll have the fortitude that you need to be able to press on. But if you miss Christ, all those other things are going to go all kinds of wacky. It says you're troubled. You're worried about many things. In verse 42, but one thing is needed. But I like all the many things. I can control the many things. Nobody really likes to admit it, but every single one of us is a control freak to a certain extent. Maybe you don't want to control much, but there's something in your life you like to have control of. I want to know what's going to happen. But this one thing, Jesus said, is needed. All those other things, they might feel like needs. They'll come and go. Time passes. But this one thing is needed. Mary has chosen that good part. And I'm not going to take that away from her, Jesus says. What is that one thing? i got a couple of verses here. Psalm 27, verse 4. We hit the button. Debbie, you get the button? Is it working? Psalm 27, verse 4. Button. I got it written here. I didn't know if I had it all the way memorized, so I didn't want to didn't try to quote it. One thing I have desired of the Lord. Here we go. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. This one thing. Just looking up the, the phrase, one thing, throughout the Scriptures. It's interesting what comes up. He says, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord, and I want, to, I want to inquire, I want to ask questions, I want to be a part of His temple. And what is the temple? It's not the building that was the big deal. It was the God that inhabited the building. It was, I want to draw close to you, God. And it's awesome that now in the New Testament, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
We get to draw close to God anywhere, anytime that we feel like, all right, God, I just want to know you a little bit more today. I want to know you a little bit more right now. But I'm not in church. There is nothing ultra spiritual about this location. We are the temple of God. So I want, I want to look into your word. I want to get to know you a little bit more and how awesome that is. That one thing I've desired. I'll be honest with you. I don't only have that one thing that I desire. That's my old nature, my flesh. It keeps cropping up inside of me saying, no, you desire that. And you desire that. And then the Lord has to, has to fight through all that stuff. The Holy Spirit has to, to mortify, kill those things. That way, Jesus can be back on his throne where he's supposed to be. I tell you what, I would love to. One day, it's going to be awesome when we get to finally be glorified in heaven with Christ. That one thing will be the only thing I design. It's going to be awesome. Jesus tells the story. He had a the rich man, the rich young ruler comes up to him. We're going to get to this in a couple of chapters. He says, what, can, what do I need for eternal life? Jesus says, well, just keep these commandments. The guy says, I've done all those things. Well, here in Luke 18, verse 2, when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. The ultimate part there being, leave everything else behind and come and follow me. This one thing is what you need. Yeah, you're a good guy, you do all kinds of things, but you still lack something. One thing, I need you to come and follow me. That's what Jesus is trying to convince Martha of right now. Yeah, it's good to serve, but we need this one thing. Paul says in the book of Philippians, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high mark of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. One thing, Paul says, that I'm going to do, I'm going to forget all that stuff that's behind. Sometimes it's easy to think about this, say, oh yeah, all the mistakes, all the, all the bad stuff that I've done. No, this was Paul listing off all the great things that he had done. He was giving his resume for why he should be an apostle and why he now should be listened to. He says, but you know what? One thing I'm going to do, I need to forget all that stuff and I need to look at Jesus. Because none of that stuff saves me. None of that stuff is going to actually help if I miss Jesus in it all. So that's why this one thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to press on. If you turn with your Bibles with me to Revelation, Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Singular Revelation, not Revelations. Sorry, one of my Christian pet peeves. Revelation, sorry, that should say chapter 2, not chapter 3. Revelation chapter 2. Jesus was giving out some letters to various local churches in the first century. And the church at Ephesus. We also have got, Paul wrote the letter of the Ephesians that we have recorded in the New Testament. This is that same church. Chapter 2, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, he says in verse 2, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered, you have patience, you have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Wow, this sounds like a great church. I mean, they're calling out false gospels, they're calling out false apostles, they are making sure that they are being patient. They're persevering. The hardship that they were under. I mean, the first century. Oh, we have it so hard here. Somebody made fun of me on Twitter because I'm a Christian. Oh. 
I posted something on Facebook the other day, and the Facebook algorithm censored it, which, by the way, is stupid. I, I'm not going to say that that's not a thing because it is dumb. I even had a, my uh, pastor's wife had shared something the other day. It said, be still and know that I am the Lord. But it was flagged as potentially violent or offensive. And I had to push a button to say, see the photo. And I was like a little leery, like, eh. This is my pastor's wife from growing up. I don't think she's going to put anything really weird, so I'm going to push the button, see the photo, and it was, be still and know that I am God. Really? Come on, Zuckerberg, I know you're listening. <laughs> Fix your algorithms. But I mean, there's so much stuff that we sometimes feel like, man, we are being persecuted for when it's, eh. I mean, these people, they were literally being martyred in the first century for following Christ. They were literally having people, Paul uh, had people following him around from town to town to town, stoning him, beating him, doing all kinds of terrible things. And by the way, let's not forget that still does happen today. But these people, man, they, they're great. This is awesome. I mean, they're, they're doing all kinds of stuff. If you were to look at that church, the church at Ephesus, you'd say, wow. They are a good church. Yet, in verse 3, verse 4, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. I have a feeling the church at Ephesus became very Martha like. They got so into doing all this stuff. To make sure that when people looked at them, that they were a good church. But they lost Christ in the midst of all of it. As we pour into our lives, all this stuff and our filter is there that we capture some things and we let a lot of stuff come out. Make sure your filter doesn't let Jesus slip through the cracks. And the same thing, a couple of churches later, that verse that so many people use talking about salvation, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, and he that opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. People say, yeah, just invite Jesus into your heart today. Don't close him out. That was written to a church. I don't want Jesus to be out on the street knocking on our church door saying, hey, do I get to come in? Or are you all still so full of your service and your stuff and your works and your events and your country club-like atmosphere that I don't get a chance to actually come and share my word? Now, Jesus needs to be center of everything. And if he's not, we better do, as Jesus says here to the church at Ephesus in verse 5, uh, remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. He's not saying don't do all that other stuff, but he's saying come back to what should be first. And that's sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing his word. In preaching on this text, Charles Spurgeon said, people talk about needing revival. I say we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. People say we need unity in the church. I say we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. People say we need to help the downtrodden. I say we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. People say we need to fix this about our church. I say we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. The guy went on for like 10 minutes with all kinds of stuff saying those things. Every little pet peeve that was in the church, Spurgeon brought it out and said, I say in response we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. Because if we have the Word of God, and if we have our relationship with Christ right, I say again, all the service things, they're going to get figured out. So let's not get so servant-like that we neglect the discipleship, yet let's also not, okay, hey, I, let's not get so spiritual and say, oh, I'm just sitting at the feet of Jesus. I'm waiting for Him to answer my prayers. I'm going to sit here forever. Wait, I'm going to be more spiritual. I'm down on my knees. I'm like this. No, don't bother me. I'm waiting for Jesus to answer. Shh, I can't hear him unless you're quiet. <laughs> and at some point, laziness and slothfulness can become an issue. 
Which is why it is not a servanthood or discipleship issue. It's a both and. I need to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. And then when he convicts me in the Holy Spirit and says, I have gifted you with certain things to work within the body of Christ and to edify your brothers and sisters, get out there and serve. Don't sit around and waste it all day. I have invested in you, Christ says. I have given you things. The Holy Spirit says, I have stirred you and spurred you on to go and be a blessing. So go. But don't forget the first works. Don't forget that one thing that is needful. And Jesus said, I'm not going to take that away from her. So Christian, where are you on that spectrum today? Have you slid too far to Martha's side to where now we've started to neglect and kind of even maybe get a little aggressive with other people that they're trying to learn and, and God is really investing in them. Different seasons in life. We're going to have some, some, some new Christians, people that are new to the Lord or new to our church that they're trying to figure it all out and see where they can plug in. And so maybe they're not plugging in as quickly as you think. Let the Lord work on them. At the same time, we're over here. Have you slid too far to this side to where now, yeah, you know, I, I just, I love having the Lord pour into my brain. I want to have all the answers to Bible trivia night. I've got it figured out. I've got chapter, verse. I know exactly where it is. I can even tell you the page number in my Bible. But we haven't actually gone out and served. Both and, not either or. If you're not doing both at some point, I even tell you this, maybe you are new to the church, maybe you are a new Christian. Let God work in your life, let Him pour into you, but I guarantee you there is something that you can be doing to be a blessing to somebody else this week. I just, I don't know what it is, I don't know what my spiritual gifts are, I'm not sure where I can plug in. Come talk to me about it. Or if you're too afraid to talk to me, put it on the connection card and say, hey, can you call me or text me? I'd love to find out how I can get involved. Let's make it happen. Because if I'm being honest, I, I tend to at times, I like to sit and read, but I'm a doer. I can very easily slide into Martha's zone. I don't want to just sit in the church pews. I don't want to just sit and have, have something. I want to be out there serving. I want to be out there worshiping God with my hands and my feet, with my voice, with everything that I do. And so we want you involved. So I get that. So if you're feeling like you're a little stuck right now, then let's, let's sit down and let's talk about that. Let's figure it out. Let's get you unstuck this week. Let's get you rolling for the Lord once again. Both and, discipleship and service. Where are you at on that spectrum? How can you do more for him in the upcoming days? How can you thank him for what you have already been able to do? But how can you take that next step in your Christian life? And that's really what the invitation time is all about. As we sing a song together, as we continue to worship Him through music, we also like to just take some time and remember and look inward and say, all right, Holy Spirit, dig deep inside of me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Convict me. Show me where I have fallen short and help me to take that next step. Because I don't care if you got saved today or if you got saved 75 years ago. Every single one of us has a next step. Every single one of us has a little bit more that we can draw closer to Christ with today. What is your step? And if you're not sure, I encourage you to come forward and let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. Let's ask the Lord to reveal that next step. So that way you can draw closer to Jesus today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for you, your word, Lord. I thank you for this time that we could be convicted from your holy scriptures. We ask, Lord, that you would have the Holy Spirit very, very prominently working in our midst right now, that he'd be showing us, reminding us of things that we have long forgotten, teaching us maybe something that we had never seen before. But Lord, when we feel that conviction, when we know that we have a next step, let us repent. 
Let us turn away from the old man, the old ways, and let us turn to you and let us walk with you. Lord, if there is someone in here today, though, that does not know Jesus as Savior, if they've never heard the good news of how He wants to forgive their sin, Lord, may they take that first step today. Please, Lord, be working during this invitation time. Be worshipped. May the name of Christ be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be here at the front if you'd like to pray about anything God has laid on your heart today. Whether it's something I spoke about in the message or not, let's truly lay down our all to Jesus today. Let's stand together.